Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 Testing Community Update webinar. My name is Kiana Trebu. I am the Executive Director of Population Health and Workforce Strategies at the Health Collaborative. And co-hosting with me today, I'm really excited about this, is Eddie Cohen, who's president of the Urban League of Greater Cincinnati. Thanks so much, Kiana. We're joined today in this webinar by local public health experts and community partners to really explore how COVID-19 is impacting our region and what has been done by all of you to slow, so slow the spread. Uh, we'll be sharing some of the latest information on Hamilton County's Test and Protect initiative, which of course, I'm sure you've heard about it by now. And we'll hear directly from community organizations that have participated. So I'll kick off since we're at 801 to go ahead and start if Tiffany is with us. Um, I'd like to introduce our, introduce our first speaker is Tiffany Mattingly. She is the Senior Director of Clinical Initiatives and Quality Improvements for at the Health Collaborative. Uh, Tiffany. Hi, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am going to take about 10 minutes here just to uh, provide an overview of our surge response uh, for COVID over the past almost year now that we've been in this pandemic. So I have a lot of slides to run through. I'm gonna run through them fairly quickly. We have about 10 minutes for this update, but I'm gonna start with some level setting uh, with our data just to show where we are thus far. So the Health Collaborative is responsible for what's called Region 6 and Zone 3, which is down in Southwest Ohio. Our, uh, our Region 3 area is um, run by the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association, and together we make up what's called Zone 3. The Health Collaborative is the hospital preparedness program for Region 6, so we have for many, many years helped hospitals prepare and respond to emergencies, and COVID response fits into this category. Next slide, please. So as of yesterday, uh, this is what the state looked like in regards to COVID cases. There were 50, almost 5,200 patients in the hospital yesterday with COVID. That's about one, out, um, one in every four patients are COVID positive and one in every three patients are COVID positive in the ICU with over 1,200 patients in the ICU. This source is through the Ohio Hospital Association and this is their public dashboard. So anybody can go out there and um, and play around with this data and take a look at it. On the next slide, I break it down to our zone that I just introduced, we're zone three. Across zone three, we have 1,200 patients in our um, hospitals and 271 in our ICU. When we go down to region six, uh, yesterday we had 742 patients in the hospital and 177 in our ICU. So matching the state, one out of four and one out of three in the ICU. We actually meet every morning our hospital steering committee. We just met this morning and it sounds like we're gonna have actually a pretty big increase in the 742 number later today when the numbers are posted. Uh, and I'll go into that um, structure here in just a few minutes. So our viral uh, reproduction or the R coefficient is what, um, or the R value is what you may hear is what we, uh, the epidemiologists monitor and we watch closely as a community to determine whether we have community spread or not. Um, you'll see that baseline there is at one. If we're below one, we, the virus is fairly well contained. If it's above one, we do have community spread. You can see we've been above one for a very long time now and actually our release today is that we are well <laughs> above one uh, as of today. We saw a little dip for um, just after the Thanksgiving holiday, but I think the Thanksgiving holiday is now um, coming to get us <laughs> with this data. So on the next slide, um, we'll, our hospital capacity is, uh, this is based off of all the hospitals in our region in Southwest Ohio. And we take a look at this every day and determine how much room we have for what we call our baseline beds, which are our, our normal operating beds. And we look at this for uh, med surge and ICU. 
But there's a lot of other variables that go along with that. And I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. In regards to testing, which is what we're really going to dive into today, um, we do look at a lot of different testing data on a daily basis when we come together as a committee. And uh, one of the things we look at is the positivity rate. And we've been watching this climb very steadily since about early October. And we're now currently at 15% uh, positivity rate for our region and um, just continuing to watch that, that climb. And you can see down below are the number of tests that we conduct on a seven day rolling average. So just getting into our structure, our surge response structure, uh, our multi-agency coalition is a pretty big structure here. So when we look at the top, we have Governor DeWine and ODH and the Ohio Department of Medicaid, as well as OHA who provides some of the data that we looked at. Um, then the zones, and then Dr. Lofgren, who is the CEO of UC Health, is our zone three leader, and he helps support both region three and region six. We are the health collaborative, and then under that, we have the multi-agency co uh, coalition, and then the steering committee. And I'll break those down here on the next slide. So we have three steering committees. We have a public health steering committee, hospital steering committee, and a congregate living steering <laughs> committee. And those steering committees are really supported um, with a lot of data and reporting that's provided to us by the Anderson Center at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, as well as the data that comes through our health information exchange at the Health Collaborative. On the next slide, I'll just uh, kind of detail out the representation on our multi-agency coalition. This is where we come together once a week and we really uh, level set a lot of situational awareness, see where we can come together to help each other, um, work with Dr. Lofgren as our zone lead who has straight connections to the state for any um, issues, concerns, or anything that we need to elevate up to the state level. Uh, we also talk with our local labs, infectious disease, work with the public information officer to make sure that we're getting our communication out there appropriately to the community. On the next slide are our steering committees and uh, the hospital steering committee meets five to seven days a week. We meet every morning. Uh, that is, uh, is comprised of our chief medical officer, chief nursing officer, and chief operating officer of many of the hospitals down here in Southwest Ohio. The public health commissioners meet um, together, the 13 jurisdictions on a weekly basis, and congregate living um, meets on a weekly basis as well. And this is a really important area because it's um, a lot of the, um, the facilities who um, may house multiple individuals in a location and is very susceptible to outbreaks. Additional work groups to help keep our work running. We have the skilled nursing facilities, an equitable strategies group, testing, transportation, crisis standards of care, which are very important as we move into really a, um, a situation where our hospitals are maxing up against specific resources, such as staffing or different mechanical resources and PPE infectious disease, and then of course pharmacy, which will be, um, which has become very important in our response and will be even more so as we move into vaccination. So, uh, and for our reporting and surge planning, I'll just quickly go over um, different reporting that we look at on a daily basis. We're looking at disease prevalence, incidence and spread, mortality data, a lot of hospital data, testing and predictive modeling. And that informs a lot of our activities and our efforts and response, one of those being surge planning. So on the next slide, I'll go into um, just some of the different discussions and activities that we really look at for surge planning. We're closely looking at bed capacity, our ability to expand and, um, and what that means for expansion uh, because staffing is a very critical component of being able to expand beds. We can expand beds, but if we don't have staffing then we don't have anyone to take care of the patients in those beds. Um, load balancing, which means that we are trying to balance the number of patients in each hospital. So not one hospital is um, being inundated with patients while another one is sitting half empty and making sure that we can balance all of the patients across the region and provide the most optimal uh, care to those patients as well. 
In that load balancing comes a lot of triage and transport, making sure we can get patients from point A to point B. Uh, and then from search planning mechanical resources, as I mentioned, such as um, maybe glucometers or ventilators, different resources that we need to take care of patients, pharmaceutical resources, all of you have probably heard about PPE, and then other modes to decompress the hospital. We have, um, I've removed a lot of sensitive information from this, but this is basically our surge planning escalation that has many different triggers. So as I mentioned, it's not just about beds, but it's about staffing. It's about um, capacity and our ability to reduce and move patients around the triage, the transport, the ventilators. And um, we move through these different surge uh, levels that you see on the left. And um, we can ebb and flow out of those, but we do have um, you know, specific staffing issues that, um, that, that can affect the surge escalation plan. So um, this is just kind of like a, uh, I would say condensed version of that. That's a little easier to see. So we start trying to do some more intrasystem system load balancing. So transferring across um, hospitals, transferring across their own system before we reach out to other systems and then um, have some other actions around scaling back elective procedures and overnight procedures if needed to help make room and free up staffing. And then last case scenario would be if we had to move into what's called an alternate care site. And um, as many of you may have remembered, we set up the Duke Energy Center earlier this year for uh, as a backup plan um, for this surge escalation. On the next slide is just a picture of what that alternate care site looked like when we had it set up at the Duke Energy Center. And I think that's all I have. There's some resources here. There's the Test and Protect resource, the Health Collaborative. Um, the CCTST is a, a access to the public dashboard, which has a lot of public data that you can um, visit on and is updated on a daily basis. And then any additional questions, I'll, you can always feel free to reach out to me and my email address is there. So with that, I'm going to, I don't know if I turn it back to the facilitators or, or yep, okay. So I'll turn it back over to Eddie. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tiffany. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, for those that are on the line that don't know Tiffany, I um, have to say she's, one of the hardest working people I know, and um, it's been really great to see her in action. Um, as you can tell by the very thorough and detailed information she shared, she is very involved in our, our Region 6 response efforts and is very knowledgeable and respected um, across the region. And it's just been really great to see her in action. And uh, thank you again, Tiffany, for sharing so much information um, and giving us a glimpse into all of the things that happen uh, in the background that are critically important to make sure we're in a position to respond appropriately to the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, the, the data you shared uh, was not positive. We know that the pandemic continues to worsen, unfortunately. Um, so excited to have you kind of level set there, share that information um, at, for Region 6 at a high level. Um, that now gives us an opportunity to talk more specifically about what we're doing here in Hamilton County to respond. So now we'll, we will hear from Ryan Sickles, who is the Community Engagement Director with UC College of Medicine. And so she will be sharing some detailed information and an overview of our Test and Protect project, which is focused on increasing and expanding COVID-19 testing here in Hamilton County. Welcome, Ryan. Take it away. Thank you. Um, and and as, as she said, um, I'm with uh, UC College of Medicine and just going to give a quick overview of Test and Protect. Uh, Test and Protect came about uh, through funding provided by Hamilton County CARES funding. The Health Collaborative is leading that charge in order to increase testing within Hamilton County. And we, UC along with other partners um, are joining in to increase the testing around the county. And so the goals of this project are to identify um, emerging hotspots, hotspots and vulnerable populations to execute community congregate care and strike, strike team testing within Hamilton County. Um, with that, we will be able to, to develop a dashboard and reporting tools uh, for data at a glance and then report the surveillance outcomes. Here you can see the breakdown of the project organization and the roles. The prime contractor, we have the Health Collaborative, 
who is providing that leadership over this project, along with Cincinnati Children's Anderson Center, as Tiffany mentioned earlier, that is providing a lot of the planning and optimization. They're doing a lot of the data and surveillance. Um, the testing coordination is provided through UC, the early intervention program that is doing a lot of the field testing operation. And then we have the other hospital organizations that are also on board with us that are providing the laboratory testing and also strike team participation. So we have Christ, Mercy Health, um, Tri-Health, Tri and UC. Here we have listed our lead community partners that are very key in a lot of the testing that we are doing. We meet regularly with the folks, representatives from this group that help us discuss um, some of the other places that we need to test, areas that are hard to reach. Um, and they also connect us using their networks to the different organizations and partners that we can join with in order to provide testing within the community. Here you'll be able to see the Test and Protect website that Tiffany mentioned earlier. It will show you a list of the different testing sites along with dates, times, zip codes, and so that you have access to testing that is happening around the county. This site here lists um, testing dates up to 10 days so that you'll be able to see. It also provides COVID testing FAQs. Um, so if you have any questions, you're able to go to this website. It's updated regularly, um, full of answers that you have around COVID testing. Here you can see those different examples. And then if you needed to request testing, you can go and apply online for organizations. As we mentioned, their strike team, we can partner with us. You'll be able to have a link to that page there. If you need to give us a call, there is a number there listed for organizations as a number, also a number that patients can contact. So let's look at who we are testing. When we look at the testing that were provided around the county, we want to know who it is and making sure that we're reaching everyone um, that we can. And so who we're testing, race and ethnicity, we can see we have 65% of our participants are white, 29% are black, uh, Hispanic or Latinx, 6%, Asian, 2.9%. And we have our other percentages listed there. Of that, you can see that 68.5% are symptomatic, and then 31.5% are asymptomatic, so folks that do not do not otherwise have any symptoms. Also listed here are other risk factors that we definitely pay attention to because we want to make sure that we're also providing testing to those that are at risk. And so we have front frontline workers. If you see there, 56.8% of the folks we're testing are frontline workers, which means we're definitely getting... Um, reaching those that need it. And then you have those with other health conditions. Um, we see drug use, those that are pregnant, other things like that. And then I wanna point also to the other factors. If you see there, 42.5% have never been tested. So that's one of the biggest goals of Test and Protect is to get those folks that wouldn't otherwise have that access. And so you have 42.5% that have never been tested. We have there listed also those that are food insecure, who might have an issue quarantining, and those that may be house insecure. And we get that information because we partner um, with the United Way to also connect with folks that have some of those factors that might need resources. And so we're able to connect them to additional resources even after testing. Where are we testing and how often? Here you can see a picture of the county um, and the purple dots indicate um, where we are being, where testing is currently happening. And so the bubbles there are centered to the site of the center of the testing where we're located. And then the size of the bubble actually indicates the amount of testing happening in that area. And so this testing map also shows you, it includes the strike and community testing that we do. When did we test? And so this project started in September. So you can see the date there where we started. And then as testing increased up until present day. And so the number of tests is the lighter blue line. And then the total number um, that we have is a dark blue line. And as you can see there, um, there was that spike around the end of November when we people were rushing to get tested prior to and even after um, the Thanksgiving holiday. So we kind of anticipate that that will increase as we get later into this year. 
And then how fast are we resulting? This here will actually show you um, how fast we were getting the results. And initially, when we first started this project, we were, it was taking a little bit longer. And I think that was just with the newness of the project and development and trying to see um, what was going to work best. And so we ended up locating another lab that we could work with that would help us get the results a little bit sooner and turnaround time. And so we're averaging um, between two to four days for test turnaround time. And as you can see here, um, by the end of December, the last um, we had is, is one day turnaround time. So it's actually been able to move pretty quickly and get folks um, their result as soon as possible. Um, and I think that is the last thing that I have. I just wanna say, I appreciate working with all of the partners that we have been able to on this project. Um, we have encountered some barriers, weather being the biggest one for us, um, lines which are increasing because of the demand for testing, um, and then doing just outdoor walk-ups and drive-throughs. But I think with our partner's input, we've been able to really um, tackle some of these things and work to serve the community best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. We have a, a question from the audience asking assurance required, um, and it's the test no cost? It is a no cost test. We do ask for insurance because there is an attempt to bill insurance if the party has them, uh, has insurance, I'm sorry. Um, otherwise, the county is follows up with the pair, as a pair of last resort. So we do ask for insurance. We don't turn, turn folks away if they don't have it. Um, but the goal is to make sure that everyone has access to testing. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, next, I want to introduce a personal friend, Jorge Perez. Uh, Jorge Perez is the president and CEO of Greater Cincinnati YMCA and just dynamic and one of our incredible community leaders. Uh, when we started this process and needed an organization to step up, they were the first to say we will open our doors um, and communities that are underserved to open up test centers. So we're going to hand it over to Jorge to really talk about his experience as a test and protect site. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, you know, one, one of the things that happened when COVID hit is we all were pivoting. And uh, that's the word of one of the words of 2020, pivots. Um, we were all pivoting, trying to figure out how we both survive and help. And uh, that's the uniqueness of nonprofits. You know, everybody always talk about how for-profits are trying to survive, but nonprofits not only had the uh, challenge of survival as a business or as an organization, but also had the responsibility to respond to the immediate needs of the communities we serve. And so when the YMC, when we heard that there was a need for sites, uh, we quickly uh, moved and pivoted from being just an advisor to being a location where we could host. we had already started to host uh, food distribution and PPE distribution uh, and senior care uh, support at our locations. Some of you guys may have heard of our pandemic child care centers for first responders. So this was just a natural next step for us and um, we were excited to serve and um, we had seven locations that we launched uh, throughout the, the region. We're in the process <coughs> right now, even last minute to make a, a, uh, one of our locations uh, five days a week um, and uh, make it available uh, as we kind of make this last push um, exclusively for COVID testing. And um, part I think of organizations like the Y, like the library is to step up and, and ask how are we needed and the partnership that we had uh, was critical. There were some hiccups I mean, we were all trying to figure out how to do COVID testing under tents, in the snow, in the rain. Um, but what we never stopped doing is saying, okay, if that doesn't work, what do we do now? How do we move forward? And uh, it, uh, at the end of the day, we uh, participated or hosted seven locations. Uh, I think collectively we've done almost 3000 tests in partnership with um, the Health Collaborative and have been very excited uh, to be part of this and we look forward to being part of continued testing and soon vaccination.
Thanks so much, Jorge. I will kick it back over to um, Kiana. And remember, if you have questions for Jorge, please, please uh, drop those in the chat box. We will take them as we're going through the presentation and at the end at, with time permitting. Thanks so much, um, Eddie and Jorge. Um, I just have to reiterate Eddie's comments. Thanks so much for being such a great partner. Um, as you mentioned, you were asked to, to come on and, and serve on the project in an advisory role and very quickly um, asked to be a bigger part and say, we wanna, we wanna make sure that testing is available. We'll make our YMCA branches available. So thank you so much. Um, there is a question uh, for you uh, around the testing and whether that testing was available only to YMCA members or was it open to the public? And then also, um, have you gotten any feedback or success stories from individuals that were testing? Uh, great question. And uh, we knew immediately that we were going to have to open it up to the general public. And so we immediately began to cast a wide net uh, in marketing in partnership with um, the agencies that we've been talking about. Um, and um, we were making it available to anybody. In fact, we were telling our members, so the people that knew us the best to tell their neighbors, tell everyone they know, let people know what's happening. And and we did have a lot of members take advantage of uh, COVID testing, but we had a lot of individuals. In terms of some uh, bright spots, you know, I have to tell you, there were some very afraid individuals. If you can think about our seniors and some of our uh, vulnerable populations, they were very afraid. And one of the things that we saw, at least at the YMCA, we began to see people that either because they had a relationship with the YMCA or they trusted the YMCA, they came out and participated in their COVID testing. I talked to a couple of our senior uh, members and we're so very thankful about what we were doing. And uh, we were working very, very hard with our partners to pro follow protocol to keep everybody socially distanced. And I know that at least at one occasion, we went out to a car and did the COVID test there. So we were, we were doing what we needed to do to take care of people in the ways they needed us to take care of them. Great, thank you so much. And you mentioned a, a really important um, component to all of this when we think about our COVID response efforts in general, and then also specifically around this testing project, you said the word trust. And we know how critically important that is. And uh, we have done a great job with identifying organizations that have built trust in these communities, uh, both among those individuals that may be members of the organization or participate in programs, but then also out in the broader community because we know how critically important that is. So trust was a huge factor, not only in identifying our, our formal partners to help us and uh, that advised us on this project um, behind the scenes, but then also for those specific organizations or locations that hosted testing, making sure that they were trusted, um, that they were easily accessible, that they had the, had the opportunity and the capability of reaching out to the broader community to share messages um, and to make sure people felt as comfortable as possible. So thank you again for that. We do uh, now get to hear from another great partner um, that has walked alongside us uh, through this project. And so we're gonna hear from David Siders with the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. Thanks so much, David, take it away. Thank you so much, Kiana, and Jorge, thank you for sharing. It's quite an honor to be working in this space with you and the YMCA. And we too, at the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library, have that inherent trust that we value greatly. Our community, we have 600,000 cardholders across the county, uh, 41 locations as a county library system, and a top value for us was, uh, has, been and continue, will continue to be, of course, equity of access, um, support of vulnerable populations, and just ease and convenience um, to provide testing across the county uh, that was easily accessible, along with that inherent trust that Kiana's talking about. So we did open up to all community members for free um, at a number of our libraries. So you can see the heat map uh, that we've created here that represents the reach that we were able to achieve. Along with that equity of access, we started off uh, testing uh, in early October 
um, every Friday, we provided four to five locations uh, for testing, um, starting in the city, uh, city center pretty much, and then working our way out across the county. And you can see we reached Harrison on the west, to our west, and Anderson to our east. And then we had time to circle back in and start to notice the trends. So if you look at the right column, you'll see peak uh, demands or the range of, of number of tests that we achieved. Um, along with the darker bubbles are locations that had uh, more testing overall. Um, so with that every Friday testing, you can see the trends on the right column and some of our locations that were in highest demand and we repeated a couple of times, Clifton, Quarryville, Cobedale, Forest Park, uh, Norwood was an absolute surprise. Um, and we chose Norwood initially as our first, one of our first sites because of the number of bus lines that that location is on, for example. Um, and then uh, Westwood, West End and Westwood had a high response rate as well. Um, so uh, we, uh, the grand total here in the bottom right does not reflect our results from last Friday. So we have hit more than 1,850 tests and we're continuing a couple of more Fridays. Um, community feedback was really, really great to hear. Um, there was a Fox 19 news piece after our first day of testing um, who interviewed a senior citizen at Avondale at our Avondale branch library who commented that she simply walked down the street from her home and she wasn't feeling symptoms, but she was concerned to be in proximity with her family and her grandchildren. So that was um, right off the bat, one of the most meaningful moments for me to be part of this experience. And then in general, um, community members thanked us. Um, some went out of their way to call the library and, and thank us. Um, some folks, it was a matter of convenience. They were simply coming in the library and picking up their materials and saw, aha, there's free testing. I'm so grateful, thank you. Others required testing for work as we all know. So we had a number of people comment and thank us for uh, helping to fulfill that work obligation to provide a negative test result to continue work. And one person said she needed a test to travel uh, for a flight uh, for her job as well. So um, overall, the, the community response was, was really rewarding. And I wanna take this uh, a moment to thank uh, Kieran Farrar for being, from UC Health for being such a great collaborator in planning all of this. Um, we did have a couple of hiccups with weather. We had some rain and snow as Jorge mentioned, and then we moved indoors along the way. Um, so we weren't able to tested every one of our locations due to space and uh, space limitations. Uh, but we were, have been able to move testing indoors and we will continue testing indoors for the next two Fridays. So I believe that's all I have, but just a big thank you for being part of this. Thank you, uh, David, so much. We know um, as you shared in, in your map, there is uh, large spread across the county where you have library locations. And that's one of the things that we really wanted to focus on with this uh, project is to make sure that there was geographical spread across the county. And so again, thinking about organizations um, that have that spread, that have multiple locations that are easily accessible for individuals, and then also that are trusted. So thank you again for raising your hand uh, for individuals um, to come out and get tested. Thank you for uh, being that partner that helped to, to transition from outdoor to indoor, uh, thinking about some of the weather concerns and things. Um, we really do appreciate it. I think there may be a question. Um, Eddie, did you have a question from someone? Sure. There's an audience question uh, for David. How have you used wraparound services for people who are, have participated in testing in your sites? Uh, well, our libraries are open. Uh, we follow strict safety protocols, of course. Uh, masks are required in our buildings, uh, but most of our library locations are open for two-hour visits. Uh, we're open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through uh, Saturday. So my first response is it, we, libraries, our library staff and our libraries, we consider ourselves second responders. 
we remained open as much as possible at the very beginning of shutdown of our communities for safety. Um, and we have a, a wealth of online services and a call center to connect people. So I think um, more specifically, one of the biggest wraparound services we've provided all along is access to computers, printing and faxing. Uh, for years, we've provided free faxing to um, job and family services. But notably during the pandemic, um, our staff personally had a huge uptick in personally assisting folks filling out unemployment paperwork. So that was such a big deal that we were happy to offer very friendly, customized help to each individual who needed help with that. A lot of job seeking, a lot of job searching, job application assistance, and so on. And then we promoted uh, carefully uh, a number of initiatives from the Community Action Agency, from uh, Ham Hamilton County. I'm probably going to forget a couple of others. Um, but yeah, we promoted other community services uh, that were out there and still available till the end of December. So I hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, thanks, David. One of the things that has happened during this initiative is just natural horizontal alignment. You know, I know at the Urban League site last Friday, we partnered with CEAI and the United Way to give 100 kids with with PPE um, and we're starting to distribute things around vaccinations, looking at that going down the line. So just really, really great to see partners coming together to really wrap our arms around community. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. And I'm uh, glad you mentioned that um, Eddie and David, there was another question that um, I just received related to what Ryan shared earlier. Uh, she talked about being able to identify some of those additional social needs at the point of testing. So there was a question for, or an ask for more information on that. Um, that is a partnership with United Way of Greater Cincinnati um, who received CARES Act funding to stand up a quick care coordination initiative called Hamilton County CARES. And so we've been working with United Way over the past few months um, we, as a part of our testing intake process, there are three questions that are asked of individuals um, to assess their need for additional resources. Uh, one question is around food access. One uh, question is around any financial or rental assistance they may need. And then another is a more general question around, do you feel you would need additional uh, support if you are required to either isolate or quarantine? Um, and so we have been able to uh, put some um, partnerships and, and agreements in place with United Way. Um, we do receive consent from each individual to share that data with United Way. And so every uh, day they receive a file from us uh, with those individuals who have consented to share their information along with their demographics, um, their contact information, and also how they answered those three questions. That allows United Way's care coordinators to reach out to those individuals very quickly um, and get them connected to resources. That includes things like food boxes and health kits, but then also United Way has partnered with some additional network partners uh, to be able to work with those individuals um, on an individual basis as well to help them with employment, uh, to help them access health services, um, transportation and other resources. So, while we may look at the pandemic and the virus from a clinical standpoint, we also recognize how it impacts individuals' uh, social lives um, and wanna make sure that they have access to resources. So we're really grateful for those partnerships as well, um, those additional resources and wraparound services that we can provide right at the point of testing uh, so that it almost becomes a one-stop shop in some ways. So very grateful for that work and those partnerships as well. Just check the chat here. And someone is asking a question. I'm gonna uh, uh, throw this back to either Tiffany or Ryan. What is the cycle threshold value used in the PCR test to identify positive tests? Was it the cycle time? Is that what I heard? Yes. Um, I believe it's somewhere between around 30 to 40 is my understanding, but I'm unsure. I don't have an exact. Thank you. 
David uh, from the library also uh, wanted to make sure that we mentioned the library's free meal services. So there is a link in the chat um, with some information about free meals. So please take that link and share it out across the community so everyone knows how they can access those services. There's another uh, question. What assistance have you given to the many human resources departments of businesses in the Hamilton and Butler County areas? So uh, we, this Test and Protect project um, is specifically focused in Hamilton County. Um, what I can say as far as assistance, um, I'm gonna assume you're talking specifically for testing. So we do uh, have processes in place where we can respond to requests for testing from businesses. Um, so we do have a strike team response, which Tiffany briefly mentioned earlier in the presentation, where if a business or organization um, has individuals that have tested positive in their workforce and uh, they have concerns about the spread of the workforce, we are able to deploy a strike team to go out to that business and conduct testing for the staff. Um, in addition to that, we also have a process in place for that business to request to be a general testing site. Um, so they have an opportunity, even if they uh, don't necessarily have anyone on their staff that is tested positive, and they wanna be proactive, we also can provide testing uh, both for their staff as well as any of their customers or clients or what have you. Um, so we've been able to do uh, that support through this project. All right, moving on in our agenda, now is the time that we get to hear from our public health departments, our public health heroes. So very excited to, uh, to hear from each of the public health uh, districts that are located within Hamilton County. Um, we know that they are our guiding light. They provide the guidance and kind of help um, advise us on how do we best respond to this pandemic. So very excited to hear um, some key messages from them and some calls to action. We'll start with Greg Kesterman, who is the uh, health commissioner for Hamilton County Public Health. Thank you very much. I'd first like to start by thanking all of our partners, especially the Health Collaborative for this monumental task that they have embarked on, now called the Test and Protect Program. When County Commissioner, or I'm sorry, County Administrator Jeff Aludo and I had our first conversations about a more complex and comprehensive testing program in Hamilton County, we had a, a big vision. What came from that vision under the leadership of the Health Collaborative and in collaboration with many, many partners became a comprehensive and important testing solution for all of Hamilton County. As we've heard today in, in the presentations uh, from all of the speakers, Test and Protect really did touch every nook and cranny in Hamilton County. And it was there to make sure that uh, Hamilton County had the best program in the state of Ohio, as well as, uh, from my opinion, in the country. The program really did focus on ensuring equity and inclusion were part of the process, and this is a critical piece of this program. When deciding locations, we heard uh, today already that there was a lot of consideration given to those that lived in specific communities that didn't have access to transportation. Um, the program really focused on making sure that the information was readable at a level that was understandable to the population that was being served. Uh, whether that be translation or um, visual, uh, they really did a great job of making sure that that happened. In addition, the testing sites felt safe. We had lots of compliments that I received about the Test and Protect program, that it was just a safe and inviting environment, which when you think about healthcare, that's not always what, what you get. So I think that's a fantastic um, outcome, quite frankly, from this program. So I, I think overall this program has done a great job and really succeeded and gone above and beyond the expectations that we, uh, that we really set out for it. We still have a lot, a lot of work to do. And as we just heard, cases are at the highest levels ever. I guess if I wanna say something that's kind of hopeful about COVID, communities in Ohio are starting to begin their vaccine. And we're really expecting this to start next week. And this vaccine is going to go to our healthcare workers and those living in long-term care. And this decision was based on a national decision and then agreed upon at the state level. And it's because we know that those hospital workers and healthcare professionals have been hard hit with COVID-19. And we really need them there to help protect us so that when we get sick, they're there to give us the best level of care. In addition, we know our nursing homes um, have just been really uh, hurt from COVID-19. The residents have had the highest death toll of any group in the nation. And so those folks will get the vaccine first and hopefully we'll offer some relief to some of our hospital systems. Vaccine signals the, that 
that there truly is a light at the end of this pandemic. And it's kind of hard to believe because we've been dealing with it throughout 2020. Once we have vaccinated enough of the population to begin uh, to eliminate COVID-19, we'll be in a better place. But the truth is that does take time. And um, we are many, many, many months away from having enough manufactured and distributed and the population vaccinated. So we still have to be patient. And so if I could end on one message, until vaccine is available for everyone in our community, we still have a very limited number of tools to help fight this pandemic. Mask, social distance, and hygiene, and what this program is all about, testing. We are coming into one of the busiest seasons of the year for shopping, getting together, going out, hanging out. We all want to celebrate the end of the year, um, but please know that this year must be different. We can't continue to celebrate the same way that we have in the past. Don't travel, don't congregate, um, you know, stay as home as much as possible and maybe even consider finding new ways to enjoy this holiday season. For each of you that have made a personal contribution, I truly want to say thank you. The pandemic is coming to an end. We can see that light. Please continue to protect yourself, your loved ones, and, and all of Hamilton County. Thank you. So much, Greg. Next, we will hear from Matthew Clayton, who is the health commissioner for the city of Springdale. Maybe he might be experiencing some technical issues. So we'll, we'll move on and next hear from Dr. Maurice Amin, who is the Assistant Health Commissioner for the City of Cincinnati Health Department. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for having uh, myself um, representing the Cincinnati Health Department. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Kesterman, uh, you know, provided uh, a really great background on what um, public health is doing and what the county and city have been doing. Um, um, at the Cincinnati Health Department, we started doing testing early June uh, and July uh, to reach our our most vulnerable neighborhoods, um, and we were and we were using you know our internal staff to do that, mm -hmm. and so we were very glad to uh, when Test and Protect program mm -hmm. became available and could I have to provide. Party. Okay could provide more, okay, could provide more, uh, sorry about that, <laughs> more um, widespread testing for our community. Um, we are also uh, working with, um, with Hamilton County to, um, sorry, just one moment. Um, and uh, um, to work on the vaccine preparation and um, you know whatever tools are necessary to provide uh, vaccination for the community. Um, and you know I echo what Commissioner Kesterman has said about you know staying safe through the holidays um, and everyone um, you know making sure that we um, do our personal part to um, keep everyone around us healthy. Um, and I don't know that uh, Dr. Moore had anything else to add, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, it, it, thinking about uh, the situation that we're in and the pandemic, and many of us are working from home and many of us are parents. So we're juggling a lot of things. So we understand. And um, your, your little one said she had to go potty and I just thought I do too what time is this one and all over <laughs> no <laughs> no there. thank you so much um so next we'll uh go back to Matthew Clayton who is the health commissioner for the city of Springdale hi Kiana can everyone hear me yes great uh thank you for uh um thank you for holding the call today and thank you for giving me a moment to speak I greatly appreciate this uh so with regard to vaccination um for mass vaccination. We've had um, a lot of conversations with Hamilton County Public Health. They've been uh, very kind about um, bringing us in on their plans and sharing information with us. So I want to recognize Commissioner Kesterman, thank him for that. Uh, we've also looked at a, um, a local research company, an outside contractor. We've had conversations with them 
and uh, we've made uh, plans through uh, equipment acquisition, um, making uh, um, opening dialogue not only with our uh, local first responders, but they've also begun uh, regional conversations um, with those uh, law enforcement and um, fire department um, uh, partners that they share mutual aid uh, contracts with. So we're looking at a few different approaches. First, um, in conjunction with a community partner who has, uh, they have an extensive staff ready to go uh, and they have uh, contracts or they have contracts with uh, uh, pharmacy and nursing schools. Uh, we're gonna approach this at um, one large community center. Uh, we've also designated multiple locations where we're gonna have drive-through clinics. Uh, through CARES Act funding, we're acquiring the needed um, uh, items to be able to conduct those. Um, and then we're looking toward uh, the opportunity to uh, further conversations with Hamilton County about uh, the approach that will happen um, in the Northwest Hamilton County region. Of course, when someone comes in for a mass vaccination clinic, uh, a drive-through event, uh, possibly, uh, mo most likely those, those events will by and large be by drive-through. Uh, it's not gonna be people from one community, it's gonna be people from the region. So as we uh, plan for a regional approach, um, very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with the County Health Department um, on those approaches. So thanks very much and uh, be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, for that information. Next, we will hear from the Norwood uh, City Health Department, Brian Williamson, who is the Public Health Commissioner there. Good morning. Thanks for inviting us to participate. Uh, I'd just like to echo a lot of the same messages my other public health partners have uh, talked about. Things are very busy. Uh, we are a small department, so we are pretty much hands, all hands on deck uh, at all times. Uh, so for us, it's extremely important to collaborate with our partners. It's very good to be a part of a team that's working well and working together. Uh, one of the interesting things is as we look at our messaging that's out there, we've worked really hard to get the information uh, that's correct and reliable where people can view it. But what happens is people have things happen at their home or at, the, at uh, uh, their individual situations. We deal with the calls individually. Uh, so that's where this effort has been critically important that when people are calling us to talk through their situation, what's happened after the holidays, and they're looking for resources I like that. some people, maybe they uh, went we have, uh, Answers to give. So that's where this group has been very helpful. Uh, when people are looking for a test to be able to go back to work or verify that they're uh, they're safe, we've had we answers. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, just thinking about some of the comments that were made from our public health leaders and then just also throughout this uh, entire webinar, uh, it just reiterates the importance of partnerships and collaboration. So we at the Health Collaborative and in, in, in UC, uh, UC Early Intervention Program, um, oftentimes those are the logos and the names that you see on uh, webinars and, and you see on PowerPoint presentations and all of those things, but we do not do this work in a vacuum. There are many, many partners that you may never see, uh, unfortunately, that uh, work with us to, to make sure that we are successful. When we think about, again, our, our public health leaders, uh, we highlighted those here in uh, Hamilton County specifically, but throughout the region, many, many other health departments have been very instrumental in helping us with this both in our overall region six response efforts, and then also advising and learning from what is happening across the county with testing um, as well in, in other places. Um, our hospitals also, Tiffany talked about the multi-agency coalition and talked about some of the leadership from our regional hospitals and uh, the role that they play. Our healthcare leaders, um, our clinicians, nurses, even the individuals that are working at registration or intake are all impacted um, and have helped us uh, respond um, successfully to, to this pandemic. In addition to that, um, our, our federally qualified health centers 
who are also seeing patients and doing testing across the region and have also stepped up to serve as uh, partners with us in, in post-testing locations. Um, the county commissioners, uh, without them, this uh, project would not be possible. Uh, we thank them for having the foresight to dedicate some funding to testing, knowing how critical uh, testing is in, in fighting this pandemic and making sure that people have an opportunity to know their status. Uh, the contact tracers that are making those very difficult phone calls and trying to get in touch with individuals to understand uh, the risks that uh, they've exposed other people making those phone calls and not being able to reach people and people hanging up and not understanding or not trusting them um, are individuals as well. In addition, I see some representation from organizations that uh, sit on the many work groups that Tiffany mentioned earlier. I see Council on Aging, I see Santa Maria Health Services, I see lots of others. Um, I always caution myself from starting to name names because I always forget some, but many, many organizations, again, that you may never see um, on a PowerPoint or, or on a list of, of um, funded partners and things like that, that are working very, very, very hard. So thanks to everyone who has played a part um, in making um, our regional response efforts successful, um, everyone that's played a part in helping it to advise the Test and Protect Project. Um, if you've made a recommendation for where we should test, if you've served as a testing location, we just want to say thank you um, for that because we know we can't do this work alone. There are a couple of other questions in the chat um, that we'll try to get through very quickly. Um, we have just about four minutes left. Um, there's a question here that says, will you require a test prior to administration of the vaccine? I'm going to turn that question over to our public health leaders. Um, Greg, would you like to address that question? Sure. There is uh, no testing required prior to vaccination. You know, we don't want anyone showing up that's actively sick. So we would ask those individuals to stay at home. And when you're at a vaccine clinic, we would ask that you do those typical things that we talked about already, which are mask, social distance, and um, hand hygiene when you're in these public locations. But no testing needed. Thank you. And then I also see that Matt Clayton of Springdale has addressed this question as well saying we will be conducting temperature checks and asking about symptoms. And then also the obvious guidance around masking, social distancing, uh, hand hygiene. There's also a question here if the slide presentation, uh, specifically Tiffany's slides will be made available online. We do plan to send out the slide deck to everyone who registered for the webinar this morning. So you will have access to the information that was shared. Another question here, if healthcare providers are vaccinated first, Will this be in a community setting or arranged separately? Wondering if one of our um, public health leaders can address that question as well. So for the most part, healthcare workers will be managed by the hospital systems um, that they're affiliated with. And I'm sure that there's some stratification. Those that are the highest risk will get the vaccine first. Uh, many systems are setting up clinics so that folks can come and get vaccinated at the, the COVID vaccine clinic within their system. Within the nursing homes, CVS and Walgreens will be managing the vaccination of both residents and uh, those employees at those sites. And then public health will kind of pick up when there's an unaffiliated healthcare facility or a EMS worker that needs the vaccine. Uh, public health will, depending on how much vaccine we have available, either just running large scale points of dispensing or small clinic hours that are available for those that are in the first tier to come and get vaccinated. Thank you. Another question here. Um, some people are nervous about getting the vaccine because they want to know what's in it. Do we have information on what is in the vaccine? So there is lots of information out there um, right now about the vaccine. I know that a number of uh, organizations are um, hosting events and informational sessions and also pushing information out on their websites. One that comes to mind for me is the uh, Center for Closing the Health Gap is hosting a conversation, I believe this Saturday. Uh, we could share information about that, but you can also go out to uh, the CDC website as well as the uh, local health department website uh, where I'm sure you can find information about the vaccine um, as well as the Ohio Department of Health website. What we can do is try to pull together a few of those resources and include that in the follow-up email that we will send to all of you uh, after today's webinar. 
There's another question in here. If you contracted COVID and recovered and therefore have antibodies, should you get the vaccine or could there be complications? The current best practice um, and my understanding is there is uh, the vaccine is recommended even for those that have had COVID-19. There is a high effective uh, rate for the vaccine, 95%. And uh, it is believed that it will uh, be worthwhile for everyone to get vaccinated. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are just at nine o'clock. I want to make sure I honor everyone's time. Thank you again for all of our speakers and presenters. Thank you all for participating with us this morning. Uh, we will be sending out, um, as I mentioned, the information that was shared today uh, in an, a follow-up email to all who have registered. Before I go, I do wanna make a very specific call to action to everyone on the call. Um, right now, the Test and Protect Project is scheduled to end uh, at the end of 2020. Um, we want to make sure that as many people get tested as possible uh, before the end of the year. And so our ask of you is to share information across your networks, your family, your friends, your loved ones, those who you serve in your organizations, whether they're members or patients or clients, uh, through your newsletters, through your social media outlets. Please share information about our Test and Protect initiatives. Uh, let people know where they can go to get tested and encourage people to get tested, especially as we move into uh, the holiday season, understanding that people are going to um, continue to gather with their families. People are, have been tired of being isolated. We understand that. Uh, but we want to make sure uh, that testing continues to be made available and that as many people as possible have the, uh, the ability to get tested. So please share this information out. Um, there is an email address here that you can utilize if you have additional questions about testing um, or if you are interested in understanding where testing locations are, please email us COVID19testing at healthcollab.org and also visit www.healthcollab.org backslash test and protect. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Kiana. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie.